Welcome to Where Secrets Go to Die, The Disappearance of Derek Hennigan. From the Detroit Free Press, I'm John Wisely. A quick listener advisory. This episode includes discussion of sex crimes involving a minor. Please use discretion while listening. When we first started recording this podcast, it was January 2020. We fanned out to almost all points on the compass. We stared into a snow squall as we drove north across the five-mile-long Mackinac Bridge to get to the Upper Peninsula. We traveled west to Hartford, Michigan where we took a tour of Derek Hennigan's hometown in a cruiser driven by then-police chief Tressa Beltran. We also headed south and took a very long one-day road trip to Kentucky to see Renee Botbill, the second wife of state trooper David Mogenberg. But then COVID arrived, and we didn't travel much at all. All of us at the Free Press pretty much covered one topic, the pandemic. It was all COVID all the time. And that was certainly understandable. It was altering every phase of life, killing millions, and at least one of the people in this story. From a news perspective, there were so many different angles to chase regarding COVID, and we chased a lot of them. I dodged the virus myself for a long time, but eventually it found me. I was lucky. I came through it just fine. But the cough lingered and affected my voice, which you may have noticed in some of these recordings. I stuck with it because for me, as a reporter, this was the story I needed to tell. The story of Derek Hennigan and Diana Maddox and Trooper David Mogenberg. The story of Jody Newman and Mike Niger, or as I like to refer to those two, the bounty hunter and the body hunter. One of the last bits of reporting I was able to do before COVID came in March 2020. It was not quite two weeks before Michigan shut down, and I traveled to Newberry for a sentencing hearing in a sexual assault case. The defendant was Derek's former girlfriend, Diana Maddox. Diana was questioned repeatedly in the Derek Hennigan case, and suspicions have dogged her online and off for years. But she's never been charged, let alone convicted, of anything related to it. Under our system, she is, like everyone else questioned in this case, presumed innocent. The case that brought us to Newberry that day was different. It was one that had lingered since the fall of 2017. A state police investigation showed that in the summer of 2017, she became involved with a local boy. She was accused of having two separate sexual encounters with him, including one on the laundry room floor of a low-rent motel near the prison on the south side of Newberry. The boy testified that he was living with his father at the motel at that time. Diana visited. They drank cheap vodka together before their second encounter. Diana was 43 at the time. The boy was 13. So under Michigan law, that's not sex. That's sexual assault. The boy told police he sent nude photos of himself to Diana. He said she told him he was good at sex. Diana appeared to have had an ulterior motive. The boy testified, quote, She asked me if I had any speed, and I told her I took Vyvanse. And she asked me if I had any. And I said, no, I don't have my prescription right now. And she's like, you should, you should get it. And I was, I would have to ask my dad, end quote. Vyvanse is a stimulant. The boy told police he had a script for it to treat ADHD. At one point, Diana was charged with 22 felonies, including four counts of criminal sexual conduct in the third degree. Diana took a plea deal in the case, and her sentencing was in Luce County's only courtroom. All rise for the Alba Williams County. It's sort of an octagon with no windows. It's in the middle of the one-story county building, which also houses pretty much all the other departments of county government. Diana sat at the defense table with her lawyer. The prosecutor, Josh Freed, sat a few feet away. 
Diana's two sisters, Mary and Christina, sat in the back row. Missy Carriage was there, too. She lost her troubled daughter, Sadie, and Sadie's best friend, Heather, to the local drug world. She wanted to see what would become of Diana. As we've said, Missy had followed the Hennigan case closely. Please be seated. Thank you. This is a matter of People v. Maddox, file 171338 FC. That's the judge, William Carmody. He called the case and listened to the lawyers discuss the deal. Diana had agreed to plead no contest to one count of assault with intent to commit sexual penetration. A no contest plea is not an admission of guilt, but it's treated as one for sentencing purposes. It means the defendant doesn't contest the charge. As part of the deal, the four counts of criminal sexual conduct were dismissed. If Diana had been convicted of one of those, she could have faced up to life in prison because she was charged as a habitual offender. The charge she pled no contest to is a felony, but the maximum sentence on it is 10 years in prison. Diana ultimately was ordered to serve a minimum of four and a half years, though even that prompted an argument at the hearing. Diana's lawyer argued she should be given credit for time when she wore a tether, an electronic ankle bracelet that allows the court to track your movements. But prosecutor Josh Freed said she should only get credit for time she served in jail. Uh, just as far as my comments for this case, uh, you know, it's gone on for a long time, and um, there's a lot of reasons to enter into a plea and sentencing agreement. That's him. As I indicated earlier in a previous hearing, uh, you know, I, I thought the court may look to actually reducing the credit for time served in jail because of all the times that Ms. Maddox had the sheriff's department running all over the Upper Peninsula for <laughs> medical issues that she may or may not have had. It sounded to me, from what I could gather, that it was more of that she didn't have. But nobody wanted to get sued. And she played the game. She played the game for a long time. And her day of reckoning is now. She's here. She needs to go to prison, a place that she has not been. She's earned it. This case certainly is a prison-worthy case. She needs to register as a sex offender, which she has done, I believe, already. uh, And will continue to do for her lifetime. I think that's important. The boy's mother also addressed the judge, arguing that Diana didn't deserve credit for time served. We recorded her statement, but for privacy purposes, we're going to leave her voice out of this. She was crying as she spoke. She said her family lost a lot of time with their son because of the case. She said the stress of the case had made her ill. It caused her hair to fall out. She said, quote, My son and I have to live with this for the rest of our life. This is a small community. People look at us all the time. People snicker. That's not fair to my son, for him to grow up like that. I don't agree with the 55 months. I believe she should have more time. End quote. Quote, You destroyed us. You don't understand. A lot of people don't. But you have no idea what that does to a child and family, end quote. Diana's lawyer, Brian Rahali, told the judge that his client could have gone to trial, but the risk was too high, and the plea agreement was a better resolution. She had earned her way to prison, not just with the acts that are alleged here, but also certainly the lifestyle that she has lived over the past decade or so. Uh, She needs to get the necessary help Uh, to get her life back on track. The Department of Corrections will provide, hopefully, the necessary tools for her to do that. When Diana was given a turn to speak, she stood behind the defense table, about 10 feet in front of the judge. He was elevated slightly on the bench. His silver hair contrasted with his black robe. He looked up from the papers in front of him, and he pulled off his glasses to eye Diana. She was wearing a jail-issued neon orange jumpsuit. Her hair was tied up in a bun on top of her head. She read a statement from a piece of paper, choking up at times as she spoke. Uh, Since this case has originated two and a half years ago, I'd have to say that my soul has been consumed with nothing but sadness and full regret of all of this from even ever taking place. I accept full responsibility for my actions, and I'm certainly not proud to think 
that I may have caused turmoil and sadness for my actions and my victims, his family, or anyone's life. When I think of the entirety of the case, I feel remorseful, regretful, and I won't stand up here today making excuses on my own behalf. I realize that this is not my first arrest. I truly believe that I can turn my life around if I was given a second chance. Diana went on to say that she'd successfully completed a drug rehab program in the past, that she had successfully run her own daycare business, and she had two associate's degrees and a certificate in phlebotomy. She noted that she wanted to be a mother and a grandmother to her family. All of us good brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers have to resist life pressures and stand firmly believing that God will pay the way for us. He's the only way, and the only way for forgiveness and salvation. So with this all being said, one could say that if you can change the way of life you are living, then you can change the way of the law. And despite the consequences, I know enough to never stop fighting to find a solution and never give up on myself. I will live again and show everyone in my family and in the community the true, honest, sincere, caring person I know myself forever to be. I'm wholeheartedly remorseful, and the truth not only will change the world, but the truth will change my life. Judge Carmody didn't seem impressed with Diana's words. Remember, she already had felony convictions for drug possession. This case has traveled a rather tortured path, and for the most part, um, as a result of your own actions, Ms. Maddox, you've been given any number of opportunities in the past only to basically flood the system with your actions. The judge said he wouldn't give her credit for time served on Tether. You've continued to play games uh, for the last X amount of years and months with this court, with the people. I'd like to find some positive to say here, despite your words. The court, the court has heard and does hear at these points in time. Most people's come to Jesus' moment. This court uh, finds that it rings hollow. All I have to do is look at your record, take into consideration what opportunities you've had that you've thrown away. So for this court to find at this point in time that life has changed for Diana Lynn Maddox, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. You've earned your way to prison. You're going to go to prison. I'd like to, along with your client or your attorney, believe that prison might be beneficial. I don't see it happening given all past actions of yourself. The judge sentenced Diana to a minimum of 55 months in prison. After the sentencing, sheriff deputies escorted Diana out of the courtroom. By then, her eyes were red and brimming with tears. She mouthed some words to her family, but I couldn't make out what she said. I asked Diana's attorney if she wanted to give us a comment. She didn't. Neither did he. I went out in the hallway to see if maybe one of her sisters would talk to us. I caught her sister Mary and asked if she wanted to speak on Diana's behalf. I don't want to talk to you. (laughs) Shove them mics up your ass. (laughs) We didn't leave it on that note, though. Michigan has only one prison for women, and it's much closer to me, only about 35 miles southwest of Detroit. So I reached out to Diana through the prison email system. At first, she thought I was Jody Newman, the bounty hunter, pretending to be a reporter. Eventually, she believed me. She wrote back and sounded open to talking. Quote, Before I do consider speaking with you, I have one question. What is your interest in writing about Derek and why? With so many years passing, and no one ever, and I mean ever, listening to anything I have to say, because they always blamed me instead of listening. Why? I knew Dee the best, and knew the circumstances, and knew everything Dee told me. But one thing no one ever did was listen to me. I tried to offer help, offer ideas of what I thought should have been done, and even what others had to say who lived in the area, who came to me and told me what they knew or heard. So why? The only way I'd agree to much more than this is this. Will you be the one to listen and not blame me and just maybe help solve this? You're going to need time to put into this to talk to me, and it won't just be an hour or two. I assure you of this much. End quote.
We'll be back after the break. And we're back. Now look, I do want to see this case solved, to satisfy my own curiosity, but also for all the people I've interviewed and people on whom I know this case has been so hard. People like Derek's mom and his former wife and his son, whom he called each night at bedtime. They deserve answers. Diana, if she wants to talk, I want to listen. I kept trying to arrange a sit-down interview. In one lengthy email, she criticized the judge, the prosecutor, her own defense attorney. Quote, Well, I need help to prove to everyone my innocent and someone to listen to me about Derek and who will fight to put them all in their place and sue the county for all the wrongdoings and cover-ups. This town is whacked as fuck, and today I'm pissed off and need to know if you'll help me write it all from the beginning. Because I get mad when I write it, and I rattle on, and I need it to be all put together and to be known what the cops didn't do or look at when it comes down to Derek. And I need it to be heard about how they built this wrongful and unlawful case about me currently. End quote. She said she had a lot of secrets to spill. Quote, I think I'm the one to do it and to bring it all up because the dirty laundry needs cleaning. And once society hears all that I know about the system in that town and what they done or didn't do, well, trust me, I'll be the one sitting on the beach drinking pina coladas, not them. I need help. Will you get my story to those that can help me and want to take this on, end quote. In her next email, she said the prosecutor and the police were out to get her. She wrote, quote, I have been wrongfully convicted over Loose County thinking I could solve the Derrick issue, end quote. In a final plea for a jailhouse interview, I told her that we already have her voice in recordings from Jody Newman, but... I wanted to give her the chance to speak for herself. She wrote back and said no. She said she was entitled to privacy and disclosing anything about her would be harassment. Quote, I may not be put on display for the entertainment of the media or the public. End quote. Diana ended that email saying she had no further comment. But then she sent me two more emails. She claimed Jody's recordings were fake or computer-generated, maybe artificial intelligence. She also said that they were, quote, illegally obtained, end quote. She threatened a lawsuit, and she accused Jody of making the recordings to, quote, personally cause harm to me and to taint the community I'm paroling to, end quote. Whatever Diana had to say about Derek Hennigan, David Mogenberg, Jody Newman, the town of Newberry, and all the rest, she wasn't saying it to me. We never did get that prison interview. After Diana served her time, she was paroled back to her hometown of Newberry, where she's now a registered sex offender. I thought I'd take one final chance at an interview, and I knocked on her door, but she wouldn't talk to me. I really wanted to talk to her. I suspect she knows a lot about a lot of things in the UP. Now again, as it relates to Derek's disappearance, Diana is presumed innocent. Since she won't defend herself, at least to me, let me take a stab at defending her. She did call Derek's mom, Betty, and his ex-wife, Sherry, to say he was missing. She called the police to file a missing persons report and asked them to search the woods near the house. Now, she did that three days after he disappeared, but she did it. Jody said Diana created a missing person flyer and tacked up copies around town. A copy of it also appeared in an ad in the local paper, The Newberry News. It included a photo of Derek and a description of his last day. It urged people to contact her if they had any information on his whereabouts. It included her phone number. It also said tipsters could contact state police. She allowed police to interview her at least 10 times and to give her a polygraph test. You can argue those don't seem like the actions of someone who was involved in his disappearance. Besides, if she wanted Derek out of the house, she had an out. 
She could have just called the cops. He had active warrants and would have been arrested. The lease on the house was in her name, and by the time he got out of jail, she could have had his stuff sitting on the curb. I also think of Trooper David Mogenberg, who's not here to defend himself. What case can I make on his behalf? You've heard a lot of his baggage in earlier episodes, and he's a story in his own right. But was he connected to the disappearance of Derek Hennigan? That's a tough call. You heard his families tell me they believe it is possible because of the things he said and did to them. The state police searched his property for Derek's remains, and they lab-tested an axe found at his home. But nothing came of those things. Mogenberg did pick up Derek for driving without a valid license a few months before he disappeared, and he took the B&E complaint from Diana, who said she suspected Derek stole her guns. Jody Newman says Diana boasted about having Mo in her back pocket, and there's at least a suggestion that Diana, or possibly one of her sisters, had his phone number. But police reports show he continued to investigate Diana's stolen guns for months after the reported break-in. Is that something he'd do if he knew Derek was dead? Did he just happen to be close enough to this that all of his baggage demanded scrutiny? I can't say for sure. I will say this. In my read of the reports, police missed opportunities all over the place, on multiple lines of inquiry. And remember, the names Diana Maddox and David Mogenberg have long been spun through the Newberry rumor mill, which continues to this day. I keep coming back to all of the people I've met over the course of this, people who've been affected by this case far more than I have. They've encountered their own challenges in trying to understand it. Their frustration stretches across whole generations. I think of Megan Mogenberg, the trooper's daughter, and all she's been through. The shadow of her father still lingers in her mind and in her life. The things she saw at home and the things she saw the day she followed him into the woods. She's appalled by his conduct and by that of his former employer, the Michigan State Police. She never did find that spot where she says she saw a makeshift graveyard. She's done her best to move on in life. The path she's chosen strikes me as a way to atone for the sins of her father. Now that's a burden no child should bear, but she embraces it. When I think about being a police officer, I think of the integrity and the accountability and the responsibility and the honor that comes with being a police officer, wearing the badge and being able to protect and serve communities. I believe in law and order and I stand very strongly against corruption. Megan has worked as a corrections officer in a jail and hopes to one day become a detective. I just want to do something that matters. I want to do something very meaningful with my life, and I want to take policing in a, in a very good direction because with everything that's gone on in the world right now, I just, I feel like that change needs to happen. It needs to be, you know, it, it needs to happen. There's just no other way around it. We need change in how we police. Then you could be that change. Right? Yes, yes, I, I intend to be that change. Megan is not the only one in this story left with questions about a father. As I mentioned previously, I tried reaching out to Derek's former wife, Sherry, and their son, Race, but we couldn't connect. Then I caught a break. It was a Friday morning after Thanksgiving. I had the day off and was spending the weekend with family at my sister's house. We had a big turkey dinner the night before. The house was still full, and we were kicking back, waiting for football to start on TV. I was lying on a couch when I checked Facebook on my phone. I saw a message from Race Hennigan. I immediately sat up straight to read it. His name startled me. Here's what he wrote. Quote, Hello, John. Saw this a while back and wasn't in the best spot to give a proper response. Yes, I can talk to you. 
Let me know a date and time, and we can set something up. I'd like more publicity on this case, as it's been quiet for a long, long time. End quote. This was very good news. There's plenty of heartache here. I never got to speak to Betty Hennigan, Derek's mom, to truly understand what this whole experience was like for her. She died before my reporting began. Missy's daughter, Sadie Overland, died before we could speak to her. Brian Mitchell, Diana's former brother-in-law, died of COVID after we interviewed him. Bert Crawford, the dog handler you met in episode one, he died too, just as we were finishing up work on this podcast. But now I had the chance to speak to someone who lost as much as anyone that day Derek disappeared. Someone who's largely been forgotten in the anguish of this case. He's not a suspect or a witness or an investigator. He's a young man who has longed to know since he was a little boy, what happened to his dad. We'll be back after the break. And we're back. Audio producer Tad Davis and I arranged to meet Race as soon as possible, which turned out to be the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. When we pulled into the parking lot of Race Hennigan's apartment complex, we got a little confused trying to find his building. I ended up calling him from the car. Hello? Uh, Race, it's John Wisely at the Free Press. How you doing? Good. How about you? Not too bad. Hey, we are here. We're in this uh, parking lot kind of by the the covered parking, but we're not covered. Um, Okay. And and which, um, uh, I think you're the building to our left. We figured it out. So we are uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan today. It's Tuesday, the 30th of November. Uh, we're going in to interview Race Hennigan, Derek Hennigan's son. Uh, it's an interview we've been trying to land for more than a year now, and it's going to happen today. So we're meeting him at his apartment, and he's waiting at the door for us. We made it inside and found a tidy apartment that Ray shared with his girlfriend, Sierra, and their new dog, Minnie, a pit bull they rescued from a shelter a few days before. My dog may bark, but Okay. What's her name? Minnie. She's going to bark until you better. Hi, 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 hi. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'll help you. I'll help you. There you go. Yeah, we just got her actually three or four days ago. Race is 21 now. He stands about six foot one with a thin build. He has hazel eyes and light brown wavy hair that touches his shoulders. At that time, he sported a thin beard that grew mostly below his jawline, leaving his still boyish cheeks exposed. We sat on his couch near a door wall as we spoke. I studied his profile in the gray light of a late November afternoon. In my mind, I was hearing the people who told me about his father, Derek, and how Derek had perfect skin and bright eyes and Hollywood good looks. I pictured the images of his father that I'd seen on missing person posters. Derek had darker hair, but the rest was unmistakable. After spending years pursuing the ghost of a man who'd been dead for more than a decade, I couldn't help but feel like I was looking right at him. We had a lot of questions for race, but we started with the easy ones. Tell us what you remember, you know, about your dad. Well, from my point of view, I mean, he was like, you know, the good old American dad. I mean, (laughs) he was your dad. You looked up to him as your superhero. I mean, you could ask him anything and you went to do stuff with him. He showed you how to do fun stuff. Showed you how to throw football, I mean, stuff like that. Play baseball, ride a snowmobile, a four-wheeler, stuff like that. I always knew him as a a loving person. He always loved me. It was always good spending time with him when uh, when I could. Obviously, I was very little when this all happened, so I don't remember very much. There's just tidbits of memory, but they're good memories for the most part. So 
Yeah. Race was still a month shy of his sixth birthday when his father disappeared in 2008. We talked about his life these days. Race likes motorsports, much like his dad did. My grandma is giving me her 56 Bel Air with a, a 406 small block Chevy and turbo 350 transmission, four nine inch rear end, stuff like that. Nice. And that's a bad car. So that's yeah. where I spend most of my free time is wrenching, building stuff. I like fishing a lot, hunting. It's just applying myself to do something pretty much in my free time, just keep my mind off of things. We asked about his mom, Sherry. We had arranged to interview her when we visited Derek's hometown of Hartford, but she said she was suffering from a migraine that day and couldn't do it. We tried other times to set it up again, but it never happened. Some people who know her well told us she has really struggled since Derek's death, and it's hard for her to talk about it. Race confirmed that. She, she probably didn't want to talk to us at this point. I, she... I honestly doubt it. She didn't even want to make beans for Thanksgiving, so. <laughs> Did you spend it with her? Or... Um, yeah. Kind of. But she was certain. I'm sorry. You're good, dude. Surprised it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Take a minute. Yeah, that's. But um, yeah. It's been hard on her, I would think. And. Mhm. Mm she um. After that, she started getting bad migraines and started having a lot of mental health problems, and she lost her full-time job because of this. Wow. And um, we had to live with my grandma, which this isn't a bad thing. I'm just crying. Because I'm crying, but um, she always made sure we had um we had clothes on her back, and uh, we were fed and stuff like that. Ray said his mom never really got over Derek's death. She she still hasn't re recuperated. She moved back in with my grandma this year, so I think that's helping her a little bit. Ray has had to grow up fast. He was close to his grandma, Betty Hennigan, and to her boyfriend, Tom Strand. He started working at about age 16, doing things with his hands. He does auto body work and other mechanics, and he likes to restore cars. As much as we wanted to hear what he knows, he also wanted to know what we know. Ray said the state police haven't given his family updates in years. He was just a kid then. Can I just have a, a brief outline of what's on paper like what sure because um, i mean obviously i have my theories but what is what is said on paper like what are they trying to say happened his question kind of threw me as i sat on his couch holding a microphone with his dog pattering around between us and racing his girlfriend staring at me i realized I know more details about his father's disappearance than he does. Well, there's um, there's a lot on paper, actually. There's about, we've probably read more than a thousand pages of documents. I think I've read a few pages of this document. Yeah. I think I read about 40 pages one night. Yeah. And so I started yeah, to tell him what I knew about some of the dead ends, about the suspicions about David Mogenberg. I told him the story about that final weekend of his father's life how he spent it with a couple guys down at Danny Murdoch's house, about how Diana's adopted daughter, Megan, said that she heard that Derek feared, quote, they're going to kill me, unquote. I'm, uh, my dad wasn't a pussy. <laughs> and them two dudes weren't built like he was. So I know there wasn't no fear for his life from them two. No, he could have handled them with one arm. <laughs> we kept talking, and he kept learning more. Have you heard the stories about the blood and the bleach and stuff mm -hmm. like that? <laughs> I, I haven't heard a lot of this. All so. right, well, I don't want to overwhelm you with it, but yeah, and, and if, it's, it's, if it's too overwhelming, like yeah. please, let I'm, us know. I'm fine. Okay. I'm, okay. Yeah. So there was uh, at one point, um, there was a, um, uh, and this was right around the time that you were dad went missing 
Um, Diana placed a phone call to her sister and um, she claimed they were fighting. She and Derek were fighting mm-hmm. and there was blood all over. So her sister's husband, uh, we've talked to him. Um, he thought Derek and Diana were fighting and Derek was, you know, abusing Diana or something. So he was getting ready to go over there. Mm-hmm. And um, then Diana said, oh, nothing to worry about. It. It's all taken care of. There's no. And so it all went quiet. So he doesn't know. He didn't go out there. But Why? Why wouldn't you get after you said there's blood, blood everywhere all and we're right. f- they're fighting real bad and there's tr- blood all over. He's that, hurting me or whatever she right. possibly said. Why wouldn't you still go at least to make sure everything's okay? Obviously, Race knows he can't bring his father back, but there are some things he hopes for. What what would you like to see happen? Uh the case just go on like not go on by like infinitely but i want there to be progress made like i want more stuff to be found out i want to keep going in the stepping stone of solving it of ending it even though he's pronounced dead and i don't know if the case is still technically classified as active since he is pronounced dead but i just i just want closure (laughs) what would that mean to you my dad to be at his grave. Found and with his mom. Where he belongs. <laughs> it is a big place, there. Mm-hmm. Derek's grave is ready and waiting. When we visited Hartford, police chief Tressa Beltran took us there. And this is the cemetery. What is the name of this? Maple Hill Cemetery. Eighteen ninety-four. Yeah, when I first came to work here, that whole section over over on the far side was not was not there. This is the cemetery. And right where that wreath is, we can get out and walk up there if you want. Yeah, would you mind? No, I don't mind. That's where Betty and Derek are at, yes. As a matter of fact, between me and Tom and um, her mom, we put the, we keep that maintained as best we can. We got out and walked up a slight hill. From the crest of it, I could scan the entire cemetery and see immediately that we were the only visitors there that day. It was January, but there was no snow on the ground. There was a stiff winter wind, though, which you hear from the tape. The graveyard is on the south end of Derek's hometown of Hartford, just off the freeway. I could see the golden arches of a McDonald's and hear the drone of the semis as they rolled past. There are a few trees in the cemetery, but the wind made it feel barren. Okay, so Derek's plot is right here. Um, Betty's. They they got him a plot? Yeah, they they made him a plot once um, that they ruled that it was an actual homicide. Um, They came out and made the plot, got the plot the same time. Tressa bent down to straighten an angel figurine on the grave that had been blown over by the wind. Before Betty Hennigan died, she arranged to get three cemetery plots. She's buried in the center one. To her left is a plot reserved for her longtime boyfriend, Tom Strand. And to her right is one reserved for her son, Derek Hennigan. His headstone is already engraved with his dates of birth and death. His death is listed as August 4th, 2013. That was five years to the day, they say, he was seen walking into the woods to meet Diana. A court ruled that's when he was officially considered dead.
Betty hoped that someday his remains would be found and brought here so that she could spend eternity near him. So far, his grave remains empty and his epitaph unwritten. We began this podcast searching for a different kind of graveyard, one with no headstones or angel figurines, one we thought might contain the remains of Derek Hennigan. That one was about 280 miles due north of the Maple Hill Cemetery in Hartford. That was a windy search, too. The trees in those woods, they swayed as we walked through them, and something in that wind tickled the nose of Jess, the human remains detection dog that led the search. The process of telling this story for me has been a search, one not just for Derek's remains, but also for the truth. What really did happen to him? Who was responsible for it? Why has no one ever been charged for his death? I haven't been able to answer these questions definitively, but I think we are closer today than when we started, and I hold out hope that this case still can be solved. Others do too, including Mike Niger. If in fact, you know, there's more than one person involved, in this case, those, those kinds of situations there, someone in the end will get pinched for something and uh, might be willing to talk. The house where Derek lived, I mean, someone could go in there now and take that drywall out and see what's behind it. You know, the lab could come in and see what's behind there, take out that, that outlet. I, I think this case is solvable. Jody Newman also thinks this case is solvable. I keep fighting for justice. I keep fighting for Derek. I keep telling people. I keep telling the next person, the next person, the next person. Whoever will listen, whoever will tell a story, whoever will do whatever it takes, it's a solvable case. Justice has to be served. I hope that by telling this story, we can stir a memory, or better, a conscience, that could unlock the whole thing. Maybe then we'll be able to bridge that distance between the empty grave in Hartford and the real resting place of Derek Hennigan. If there's more on this case you think I need to know, please reach out at wiselyj at proton.me. This podcast is a production of the Detroit Free Press. It was investigated, written, and hosted by me, John Wisely. Our executive director is Anjanette Delgado. Our executive producer is Darcy Moran. Kathy Kalashevsky is our story editor, and Jim Schaefer is our managing editor. Nicole Avery Nichols is editor of the Detroit Free Press. Sound design and mix by Garrett Tiedemann. Original theme music by Camilla Cantu and Brian Castillo. Thanks to associate audio producer Robin Chan and development and contributing producer Tad Davis. Adrian Roberts also served as a contributing audio producer. Gina Kaufman, Alicia Anderson, Darcy Moran, and Jim Schaefer were our fact-checkers. Herschel Fink conducted our legal review. Photos and video by Kathleen Galligan, Ryan Garza, Kelly Jordan, David Rodriguez-Munoz, and Cody Scanlon. Brian McNamara designed the podcast logo and website presence. Pat Byrne, Brian Todd, and Kayla Cockrell provided digital design and development. Amy Hushka, Brian Manzulo, Alyssa Robinson, and Tanya Wilt handled audience strategy. Leah Olajide handled newsletter strategy. Thanks also to our print team, Joe Sabolski, Steve Peppel, Janet Graham, and Holly Griffin. 
Special thanks to Amber Hunt and Carrie Jr. II for their support, and Peter Batia, who gave this story room to run. Once again, a very special thanks to former Free Press photojournalist Kathleen Galligan, whose initial reporting was instrumental to this story. For more on this story, including photos, videos, and source documents, see our Where Secrets Go to Die show notes. Finally, thanks to all of you for listening to this podcast. This has been a passion project of mine for several years now, and I'm grateful to all the people who trusted me to tell their stories. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to the Detroit Free Press if you haven't already, or to the local paper in your area. Journalism matters, and it depends on readers and listeners like you. For resources to help with cases of suspected child sexual assault, call the National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-422-4453. This podcast has touched on several other serious problems, including drug use, sexual abuse, mental health challenges, and human trafficking. Please know that help is available. See our show notes for links to groups that offer broad-based support for survivors.